Mayor Kelly Gertz, thank you so much for joining me in this chat today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, yeah. In, uh, in the springtime, we were doing a series of chats with different people around the community that we were calling kitchen table chats, although I was at different tables throughout my house. But, um, sort of a my kitchen tables just chat. on the other side of the fireplace. So. Yeah. So these are kitchen table proximate chats tonight. Yeah. Uh, thought about calling it happy hour chats after we talked about the timing, but uh, yeah, so excited to, to bring it back now this fall and hoping to continue forward doing something like this with folks in, in, the, in general. Um, and Mayor Kelly Gertz, would you like to share with some folks any thoughts that are on your mind pressing before we launch into some of the stuff we talked about? Sure. I mean, I'm uh, obviously sitting here in October of 2020, which is um, a strange time to be on the planet at all. Um, as if there's any that's not, this just is, I think, on the particularly far end of the crazy continuum. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a hell of a year for everybody and, and continues to be, I mean, every day I wake up and think like, what more nuttiness sort of can collectively drop upon us? Um, you know, and certainly uh, here in Athens, Georgia, a town that's part of the SEC football universe we have the first home game this weekend and so i'm uh hoping that everybody stays safe and smart and um and and, and comes out of this well um so yeah and, and i think that for the year obviously yeah um well actually before we get into some of what we talked about i am curious with game day around the corner um you know it seems almost like an absurd time to try to have any kind of game day activity, but obviously like lots of folks are going to be showing up to tailgate and things. Um, what's your sense of, you know, if you could give kind of a brief overview for folks of, of what's being planned to kind of keep things. Yeah. So, um, so the university stance on campus is no tailgating. Um, and, and so in technical terms, that means no coolers, no grills, no campers, no tents. And then on the athens clark county lots that we manage that there's the same approach um, the university is allowing people to arrive up to three hours early um, you know with the stated intent at least of being able to have people filter slowly into the stadium rather than cluster and congregate um, th this is a 7 30 p.m game against auburn you know just historically auburn tends to bring the party to town and, and so we're, we're, we're not needing a party of anything like the traditional varieties. So, you know, that, that's my words a few minutes ago about everybody staying smart and safe. Um, Auburn is the game that produced my uh, mailbox showing up in splinters in my front yard one year. So uh, anyhow, conscious of that kind of specific history uh, with, with, with that uh, opponent. Um, uh, we're paying a lot of attention to see, okay, with the subsequent three home games, you know, what may we need to pivot on. Um, we're doing a lot of messaging just about mask wearing. So the, uh, the mobile uh, traffic lit up signs are on Prince Avenue and West Broad Street and Oconee Street coming into the core of town to alert people to the reality that masks are required by law. Um, I was in a conversation earlier this afternoon with a handful of university city mayors um, that I'm on every other week, uh, really since just after the pandemic started. And, uh, and, and those are always valuable because, you know, I, I learn from other city leaders what they're doing that's being successful or not successful in some cases. And I mean, the general sense is that um, in the football towns that have already seen a game happen, that the games tended to be relatively low key. I mean, in some cases, um, like the University uh, of Florida is in Gainesville, and the Gainesville mayor was on, they haven't even sold all their tickets, even at 20% capacity. So I just think the public broadly is recognizing, you know, this pandemic is real and it has real human impacts. Um, obviously, we learned today that the president and the first lady, you know, who were among the, you know, chief pandemic misinformation agents, you know, tested positive for COVID, um, you know, and, you know, first inclination in my brain, if I was to reveal that is schadenfreude. Um, but secondly, it's like, geez, this is real, everybody, you know, even those of you who may have been skeptical. So uh, anyhow, that's quick and dirty. 
Um, uh, County Manager Blaine Williams and I did go up to Clemson, South Carolina two weeks ago um, to witness one of their, as a matter of fact, their first home game underway, just to see mm -hmm. if there were any lessons we needed to learn. Um, they kind of much like I just described other communities experiencing had a super low key day. Um, we talked to a lot of code enforcement folks, some police officers, some door people at bars. And they said that the day was really chill, but they did say that the previous evening, Friday evening, was pretty live in the neighborhoods with house parties and the like. So we're, we're particularly attentive to uh, informing people on the legal limits around that kind of behavior tonight. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for uh, thanks for that rundown. Um, so one thing that comes to mind for me when I think of game days, of course, is the big crowds and um, a lot of folks were talking about in the protests that we saw earlier this year that we had this heavily elevated presence of law enforcement um, for crowds that certainly did not exceed the, the types of crowds that we see for game days typically, um, which seemed kind of like a grand irony to people. Um, for folks who are watching and may not know, um, kind of the, the uncomfortable impetus for this discussion was as one of many people who was very surprised and angered by what happened on May 31st, when I had seen you at the June 6th rally, I was like, hey, we need a press conference. And, and you said, well, what if we talk on Zoom? And so now we hear, here we are months later doing that, which I'm very grateful for. Obviously, you've had a lot of time to talk about what happened on May 31st since then. Um, but there's a few things that have remained um, like a little confusing to me still, I think, and so others I know. And so I was hoping that we could spend a little bit of time maybe just kind of running through some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so to begin with, um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, a, a, a demonstration is being planned. Um, it's being planned by residents of athens Clark County that's uh, stating that it's going to be expressly peaceful. That's That's been the call that's been put out. Of course, it's existing in the context of all kinds of things we're seeing around the country. Um, and for the first time in some time that I can remember, I, I, we had a curfew put in place, um, which, I, which then, as I understand it, was part of the justification for the use of force we saw later. Um, so before we get into that, I guess I was curious about like who decided on the curfew and when were you as mayor looped into that process? Because I think that's been very confusing. It, it is for me still even, and I think it has been for a lot of others. Sure, um, I mean, a couple of notes. I mean, you, you, you mentioned context, um, and I've been in Athens for 25 years and have attended I mean, dozens and dozens of demonstrations and pro protests. And um, in, you know, in, in any of those in years past, um, you know, around the time of Occupy, when the Iraq war was starting in 2003, um, you know, prior to that, you know, s sort of concurrent with the WTO protests uh, that were in Seattle in the late 90s, you know, th those didn't come with some of the specific challenges of this era. Um, you know, obviously you had that very same week fire set in Nashville and Atlanta. And so I think there was an edginess uh, among law enforcement people. So I say that as an observer uh, or, or just a sort of social historian, I guess, um, you know, if I was to draw a contrast between the context of any of those many things that I've attended in the past and May 31st. Uh, now that said, um, I think you know this because you're commissioner elect, longtime uh, individual attentive to kind of local government and local organizational activities. Um, in, in most cities, as in Athens, Georgia, the mayor is not the chief administrative officer. You know, you, you find that other model, the chief administrator is mayor in Chicago and Atlanta and New York City, but, but not in most towns. So, so my role is more akin to the secretary of state's role, you know, in the, in, in the Congress in Washington, D.C. Now, that said, I still communicate very regularly with the county manager and the assistant managers and everybody else in the administrative apparatus that, that do the day to day work. So, you know, I'm very conscious that, you know, that there was going to be, you know, opportunity for um, for social protest, um, for direct action, you know, as, as there's a long history of here and in the country and in the region. Um, you know, was was glad to see, you know, a great turnout 
you know, concerned about justice uh, during the day. And um, I, I think through the bulk of the day, um, you know, really the sense from just about everybody, you know, of any perspective that the interactions were positive. Um, police officers on the street were fist bumping, some of the marchers, you know, it, it just, you know, there's a good vibe during the day. Um, that probably turned somewhat mid or late-ish afternoon um, when there were some folks who showed up with firearms and, you know, and we could have probably a whole conversation about the sort of history and cultural roots of the open carry movement that really kind of started in the mid nineties, um, right before I moved to Athens, I lived in Austin, Texas uh, to take a semester's worth of graduate school classes. And um, I, I was there when Texas became one of the first states to allow open carry. And I just remember thinking, what in the hell is going on? Um, and, and so we, you know, we saw that on the streets of Athens. So you had people with long arms and rifles. So I, I think that added a, an additional edge of concern or, or maybe even bewilderment um, to, to local law enforcement officers. Um, I, I went home. I don't know, seven o'clock that evening or something like that. Um, and uh, got a call about nine o'clock that, um, you know, there was still some activity in the street. There's concern that some of the armed individuals, you know, had some uh, had some contacts in the crowd that was still present on, on Broad Street near College Avenue, um, you know, and that a curfew would be enacted um, to, to get everybody out of downtown you know, and ensure, uh, I guess I'd say probably even more so that additional people wouldn't arrive downtown uh, mm -hmm. should there be some uh, uh, more armed people who would come downtown. So you were basically just advised that it was happening. There wasn't like a, they didn't ask your thoughts or like get your permission for it. It was just kind of happening and just, it was like an FYI. Well, it, it was, a uh, you know, th this is going to happen. Any thoughts? Yes. I mean, you know, the question was, you know, well, and then I said, well, I mean, it seems to me that if you just are concerned about more people coming downtown, that if a perimeter is set up downtown, that will make it less likely that more people could come downtown. And, you know, if you're concerned about some of the people that are there already, that they wouldn't have their, uh, their numbers mount. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, primarily advisement, certainly asking my thoughts, but but I'm not in the decision chain there. Okay. Um, um, you know, so other than as a, you know, as a, you know, any thoughts kind of a question, okay. not a, not a, you've got to sign off on this. Okay. So. Um, and so that was essentially the the manager's office then that signs off on it. That's right. Um, okay. And then when you looped in the commissioners, that was after it had already been put in place or it, it um, was around that time um you know in in, in the nine o'clock hour okay um so when it finally got published it was around 45 minutes after the curfew was supposedly set at 9 p.m right that's so right one of the first questions that seems really strange to me is how can we have a retroactive curfew put in place you know how, how can you tell everybody sure. at 9 45 that a curfew has been in place that no one knew about until that moment. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and I'd heard the same, um, you know, I mean, my, my observation is just that in the preparations, nine o'clock was set as the time. And by the time public information happened, it was 45 minutes later. Okay. Um, and then, um, so then sometime between when the curfew is set, and when tear gas is happening, there's dialogue occurring, right? Mm -hmm. um, were, were you looped into that at all? Was there, or, or was that? The, the, the one piece of dialogue I was looped into was that um, there were some state police that were present that either were gonna have to stay or have to go. Um, you know, other things were happening throughout the state. Atlanta was still a very live scene. And so I was looped in to say, you know, either state police are going to stay or they're going to go. If downtown isn't going to be cleared, they're going to go. Uh -huh. And uh, and so I got that from the state and I passed that along. 
So that that was sort of my I was the communication liaison there. Okay. And um, uh, and so I called the chief. So hey, chief. You know, I got a call from the state. You know, I'm chief elected official, so I guess they just came to me. Um, you know, they either are going to go back to Atlanta or they're going to stick around. So that was that was the juncture that I had a conversation around late that day. And so when when I hear clear the street, of course, there's a lot of ways that you can go about that, right? You can have officers move in and say, you know, the thing mm -hmm. I've seen at many protests, including here in Athens, which is officers move in and in person say, hey, you've got to go. You know, usually they even give three warnings, right? And then after the third one, it's almost ceremonial the way they just sort of arrest people. Um, Right. Yeah. So were you were you under the impression that that was going to happen again, or was there a discussion about how clearing the streets was going to occur? No. Yeah. So, so so I didn't know what mechanism you know tear gas obviously de deployed in this case. You know, along with some um, yeah beanbag uh, some beanbag ordinance. Uh, you know, a, a post. You know, I mean, within a days. I mean, it was clear, and and I'll get back to this in a minute. I mean, it was clear that a, a big failure had been to just not engage live in person on the street, human being to human being, and say, hey, we have got to clear the street. You know, are, are you willing to move? Or, or, or as an act of civil disobedience, do you prefer to be arrested? Um, you know, that, that's, that's the kind of dialogue that some cities have become, you know, excellent at doing, and it wasn't in place here. And so, so I guess what I'm curious about is why, as a city that's had that as a practice in the past, that many demonstrations I've been at, uh, and that is really, you know, our our police department is very focused on this idea of community policing, um, like why that didn't occur, why there was just this, you know, we can get into the details, like for people who may not know and are watching this now or later, a drone was flown overhead that made the announcement, although if you hear the videos, it was it was borderline inaudible. It was really hard to make sense of. It was certainly confusing to people what it meant because um, they had, hadn't had any personal interfacing with any officers and that was it. And then tear gas came shortly thereafter. Um, yeah, so and really, the first... and ultimately that's a question for the police chief. I mean, he'd be best situated uh -huh. to, to discuss that. I mean, as an observer, he obviously had been here for less than a year. You know, I think if you had had somebody who had a multi-decade relationship with the community like like a Jack Lumpkin who just knew how Athens runs you probably would have seen a different outcome I mean I, I don't know that that's a failure so much on the police chief's part as it is just a you know infamiliarity unfamiliarity yeah. with the local scene so yeah so uh drone as you mentioned tear gas deployed and then you know 20 ish people uh, arrested. Have you heard from anyone since like what the reasoning was for why to you why why using force instead of engaging like what what the rationale was? Sure. So in one of the discussions I did um, in the couple of weeks following with the police chief, mm -hmm. he indicated that it was his impression. And again, I'm sort of just relating what he, he provided that that a uh, lightly dispersed canister or a couple canisters of tear gas would be a calmer way, a less damaging way of clearing the street than direct engagement. Now, of course, you know, this is at midnight, you know, I mean, my question would be, well, you know, what about if at 10 o'clock <laughs> there was just a conversation on the street? Yeah. Um... So I, I, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, sorry to back up. One other question that I have is, um, so my understanding, and I, and I might be wrong about this. I mean, you know this stuff much better than I do, is that the way like the emergency powers work, the manager has kind of unilateral authority to do something like call a curfew uh, or the mayor could as well, correct? The mayor um, with the commission. The mayor with the commission. Okay, That's so correct. you couldn't, on your own, yeah. you would need at least a quorum. To, Th to that's right. Yeah. So um, like, let's, I mean, let's just imagine a scenario in which uh, you knew that there was going to be a special event and you knew that it was going to involve just lots of interaction and you wanted to make sure that the streets were clear by midnight, you know, simply as a matter of, you know, let's say in the most benign way, you know, cleaning up the streets. Um, 
you know, the, the mayor and commission could on a Tuesday say, hey, we're going to have a midnight curfew this coming Saturday so that we can just get the streets cleared up and get business uh -huh. orderly by the next morning. Okay. Um, so in a situation where it seems like time is of the essence, the only person who can make that call on their own would be the manager. That's right. Um, and so when he asks you like, hey, what do you think about this? Can you say like, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, and and like, like if you were to kind of push back on that with that, I, I'm assuming, I mean, it seems like you have a good mm -hmm. relationship with Blaine and stuff. I mean, with, yeah, with that. I, yeah and, and I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it's hard to go down the road of the counterfactual, you know, around yeah. a specific event like this. I mean, I will share that, you know, in the wake of, you know, my frustrations and growing understanding uh, over the course of the several days after May 31st, um, I, I was, uh, I, I was pretty firm about not needing a curfew the following week. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I think other commissioners were too. And, you know, now you and I had a conversation on the street that next week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of me being present on the street that next week was simply the realization that if the mayor's hanging out in his shorts and t-shirt downtown and talking to people on the street and you know bringing pizza down there that that conveys in an informal way a message like there is nothing to fear here uh -huh. and and i wanted that to be the tenor of that day having experienced something dramatically different or at least you know been been here uh to to be around for something dramatically different Although less than a week prior you were you were in the march of that the demonstration the week prior right so i, I was was it the because i i know i and many other people kind of assumed that may 31st would have gone the same way you know that like people would um generally probably not see this so bad since you know we have mayor and commissioners present you know in this in, in the march you know at the demonstration mm -hmm. so what yeah. was different I, it seems to me like something else must have been different. Was it a conversation that you had had or? Well, uh, I, I mean, it was, I mean, obviously it was after that first event having, you know, you know, fallen to shit. <laughs> and so yeah. I, I think everybody recognized like, let's not do that again. And, uh, uh, and, and with that knowledge, that experience, um, you know, it, it, I think provided me and Russell and Tim, you know, who, who all showed up at various points downtown, you know, the, the desire to say, like, let's, let's do everything possible throughout this afternoon and evening to um, kind of maintain a humanity around this event that, that ultimately didn't remain true. Uh, you know, again, uh, the previous weekend, you know, I went home 7, 7.30, something like that. After the bulk of the day's sort of formal march was over. Obviously there was sort of informal gathering that continued after that, you know, mm -hmm. from, from midnight, uh, from eight until, until midnight. Um, and, and I didn't want to see a repeat, um, you know, in, in the next couple of days after the 31st, you know, among the lessons learned for me and, you know, one of the great things about this life is that it constantly provides lessons <laughs> that, uh, that that you can uh, you can learn from and improve upon and get better around is you know better not to opine about something that you don't know all the facts around and uh -huh. clearly I didn't know all the facts around the evening of the 31st that next day or the following day but they unfolded you know as more and more audio and video and testimonials and interactions kind of demonstrated the, I mean, the sort of true nature of that evening versus the sort of maybe single faceted version of that evening. So I think that, I don't want to opine over this for our whole chat, but I do think I have a, a couple questions left. Um, and one of them is around that, you know, there's this feeling that I felt, and that I think many have felt that we've felt like lied to or or betrayed by official proclamations that were put out by the police department and by the county government mm -hmm. that even by me did not match the facts of the night you know and i knew that yeah. right away because i was like well why are they talking about boogaloo boys like those folks were gone hours before this um so i guess this is sort of a mix of a like why 
were those well i guess i'll just start that i have a second question after but like like why was so much incomplete or misinformation put out there you know the bricks in the tents or the, the mm -hmm. you know because if if i'm in the public a member of the public and i, I want to trust that the community police the, the, the department that's doing community policing the local government that's in charge of them um not in a direct way maybe in that night but generally it's the mayor and commission that does oversee and evaluate the ma the manager right um if, if they all have the interests of the people in mind and the people were peacefully in the streets um, and a few people with guns showed up seeming, you know, quite scary and antagonistic, you know, A, why didn't the police interact with those people when they arrived on behalf of the rest of the people who weren't with them? B, um, why did the police then enact, you know, escalate something on people? I mean, it just, it seems like kind of a no it seems pretty easy, I guess, for the narrative for the public to be. And it's certainly been my analysis of this to date that like the police almost like, it seemed like the police used the excuse of the presence of other people to get the protesters out of the streets in a way that what that involved using force. Um, and I guess I'm curious how we're to trust the local government and police department moving forward um given that their official reporting during and after didn't match the facts of things um, yeah no and and i think that's i think that's the question and and that only comes through demonstrated quality work i mean i you know i i, I can't i can't defend things that were not of high quality or you know appropriate layout you know, I mean, the, the, the problems of the 31st were the problems of the 31st. Uh, I mean, certainly the next day, in lieu of the department really doing a thorough review of, you know, what happened and failed to happen, um, you know, I sought to get something out based upon, you know, what I believe to be true, which, you know, later that week even found out to be incomplete at best and and uh and, and counter to the the fact the the statements kind of on the far end at worst um i mean so, so now the police department's got a bigger job to do you know they, they, they've got a trust building job to do so i i so how do you imagine that you or we um in assure that that happens, I guess. <laughs> um, how, how do we, how do we, um, it, like in my mind, it starts with a public apology, you know, like a recognition that this didn't go the way it should have. Uh, and, and then from there we move forward. Um, so that's the, that's the first part that I haven't, unless I missed something, I haven't heard from the police department or the manager or, you know, you or anyone in the, in the local government. And, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm, with you, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've made a public apology a couple of times around it, um, uh -huh. but, you know, the I think the substantive movement is to say, you know, how do we put the mechanisms in place, the structures in place, and the policies in place that not only keep the bad reactions from happening, but create foundations for good reactions mm -hmm. to all things. Um, in, in government activity, particularly policing, an area that is always sensitive, always should be sensitive, and particularly in, in this recent set of years when there's been such a traumatic recognition of, you know, historic injustices. And so, so that includes, um, you know, having an appropriate use of force policy. Um, that includes thinking about not just the police department, other elements of the justice system, but other adjacent community supports from early childhood education to neighborhood supports to wealth building, um, you know, and, and also includes protocols around getting good information out when there, when there are stumbles. And, um, and I think those protocols didn't exist on May 31st. Is there, um, 
Have we dropped the charges? Has the county dropped the charges on the folks who were arrested? Yes. So, so no one's currently being charged? That's right. Oh, okay. Um, that's really good to hear. I wasn't clear on that. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. really glad to hear that. Um, and then, yeah, I guess like when I think of like moving forward, there's the need to both build trust with the community again, and also to try to make things right for the people who were harmed in that, right? The people who were like shot with beanbags, um, but weren't really doing anything that warrants that, you know, we can talk about that's much better than getting killed for sure, you know, but uh, you know, these protests are because of the deadly violence that we're seeing around the country and it, and so um, I, I guess I'm wondering what, if anything else you think we can do to try to make it right for the people who were directly affected by that. And then from there, I'd love to pivot into some of the policy stuff that I think you and I are mm -hmm. both excited to talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what what do you have in mind, Jesse? What, what would you think would be helpful? Um, I don't know exactly. I'm really glad to hear that the charges have been dropped. Um, I would hope that if anybody has medical expenses, like if they had to go to the hospital or something, that the county would also find a way to pay for those. I don't know how that works, you know, without us being sued or something. But um, And then I would think that like, conversations in the future, like trying to loop in the people who have been affected by this very directly and, and give them some um, some meaningful like decision-making power and how we can like revisit some of these use of force policies and things like that, right? So, I mean, if, if the folks who are in the streets protesting police violence are then victims of it, albeit in a lesser form than the types of instances that brought them out there in the first place, but still in a quite frightening form, um, I would think that those might be among the best people to loop into some of the, the policy making that we're looking to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the same way we talk about, we had that wonderful presentation on participatory budgeting, you know, having maybe like a more robust participatory policy making process, especially around public safety. The yeah. specifics of that, I would hesitate to say I could flush out on this call with you right now. We'd obviously sure. have to work with other people. But. One, one relevant opportunity is that it, it probably will be this month that the um, uh, community police advisory task force, you know, presents their proposal for the ongoing uh, advisory board, and there's going to be public input opportunity there. And uh, so, so I would encourage anybody who's listening to this, watches it in retrospect, to be engaged. If you look at uh, ACCGOV.com, just the county's main landing web page, there will be an announcement there of public input for how that police advisory work is going to happen on a permanent basis. Okay. And so will that be the report that drops um, mid October and then it'll be voted on in the November meeting? Is that, uh, or like it'll be officially accepted in the November meeting? It, it, um, it may not be that soon. Okay. So I, I think that body is right now putting together a recommendation about, you know, what the permanent advisory body um, is should look like, what their responsibilities should be, what their staffing level should be. And then they're going to take some public input on that. And, and I think that's going to be a lengthier process from just mid-October to uh, first Tuesday, or well, it'll actually be the first Wednesday in November that our voting meeting is this month because of election day. I, I think it'll at least be another cycle. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, well, I guess my, maybe my concluding thought on this, and then I'm, I'm excited to pivot to some policy stuff with you, um, is there's a thing that's really sat with me. I wrote it down in my notebook to try to get the quote right. When you talked with Chris Xavier, um, and he had said, you know, what is the solution if not removing the thing that in every iteration is trying to kill me? Um, and thinking about how there's this black led movement talking about how police violence is married to white supremacy and racist violence. And we know the history that goes back to the KKK. Um, I hope that in the conversations moving forward about how we build advisory boards, about how we look at use of force, about how we imagine public safety, that we really take seriously how true that is. Because I've, I've heard so many people say very similar things so many ways my whole life. And I think we're seeing people, especially black people collectively say this in, in 
honestly like remarkably peaceful ways you know in the wake of violence continuing to be peaceful is is in my view like quite phenomenal um and and to continue to be met with violence i feel like there's a really big onus on us to justify how we can keep in place um departments and systems where so many people feel that way and of course not everybody feels that way but a huge sure. portion of our population that is their reality and yeah so, well i i i'd always note that a lot of things can be true at the same time so oh, while well, you can have recurrent use of violence illegitimate violence by police departments you can also have large portions of police departments doing helpful work mm -hmm. and you know so i i never think about this as a zero-sum game it's one or the other uh, you know and, and and certainly the history of police departments in the united states is not unlike the history of other institutions in the united states mm -hmm. if you're looking for the specifically racist roots of them you know you could look at the real estate industry or lending and banking mm -hmm. or public health or k-12 education I mean, and, and all of those are institutions, you know, that need to be explicitly working to be anti-racist and inclusionary. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I want to make the point that the challenges for police departments are not their challenges alone, mm -hmm. but their challenges for all of us in American life to ensure that, you know, we are building supportive institutions uh, wherever we go. Totally. Um, well, that feels like a good pivot to another thing I wanted to talk about with you. You heard me bring it up at the, the goal setting thing. Um, my, when we were asked to encourage, wouldn't it be cool if blank in 10 years? And I said, wouldn't it be cool if we had an empty jail in 10 years? Just no need for the jail to be a jail anymore. Um, and I've been reading this book, which I've been plugging a lot to people lately, uh -huh. Waiting for an Echo, The Madness of American Incarceration. And it, it talks about, uh, you know, we... The, the short spiel on this, I guess, is that we're a nation that imprisons more people than any other nation on mm -hmm. Earth in the history of the planet. Um, more than China. Yeah, more than China it's, by number. As five well times as our percent. population. Yep. Yeah. Um, and a huge portion of those folks have documented cases of mental illness that only are exacerbated by being there. Others develop it, develop mental health issues that are severe while there. Um, see a lot them of people, exacerbated. Yeah. Trauma is, re, you know, people relive trauma again and again, experience new traumas, um, as well as, of course, a huge portion of the remainder of people who are in jail being there, very directly related to economic reasons. You know, we look at the most thefts, for example, and lots of other things, as well as just your ability to effectively defend yourself and not end up in prison, heavily related to your economic situation. And so in Georgia, we have this, uh, we actually have the highest uh, rate of people in the criminal justice system of any state in this country mm -hmm. has the highest rate in the world, although... Particularly folks on parole. Yes, yeah. Um, and then here in Athens, we have the highest poverty rate of any urban county in the country. So it starts to feel like all of a sudden we're sort of this... Uh, sort of epicenter of problems. ...example of a lot of the biggest problems, uh, which makes me feel like we're also set up to maybe be... Uh, sort of like almost like a lighthouse community in a sort way. Sort of an exemplar. But yeah, do things dramatically differently because we are this particularly dramatic example of what's wrong. Um, and so one thing I'm excited about, the crisis intervention response units that we have, um, in my view, I, I think of like a public safety department as functioning almost entirely the way those units do. Um, where it's it's very much about de-escalation. There's no incentive to arrest, yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. Um, or there's an explicit uh, directive to not arrest. Um, and so I guess I'm curious your thoughts on where to begin in terms of resourcing the community more broadly mm -hmm. so that even having more crisis intervention response units is meaningful because there are places we can take people um, or there's uh, more decriminalization and things occurring so that we you know, not people. So the, the, the first thing I always would, would turn to is just doing really high quality analysis of where we are uh -huh. at, at this state and time. And I think we've got a lot of this. It's not quite packaged or assembled in the collected way that we need, but, but I, I think we're 
we have it within our easy capability to get there, given the very smart people and the expertise right here in Athens. And so that is to say, um, what is the nature of our population who've been criminalized? You know, what is the nature of our jailed population? Um, what are those sort of whistle stops along the train tracks that have gotten people there? Mm -hmm. And then once we know that, you know, what are all the interventions that we can do at every stage in life, um, starting from birth or pre-birth? So, um, I mean, among my overarching goals for this community is to put the, the structural foundations in place that are just going to ensure vibrant and healthy and fulfilling lives. And so that's got to include being well resourced from a health perspective. That's got to include having safe neighborhoods where you can access like fun stuff. You know, fun is important. Um, fun uh, is important. Fun is important. And, and can, uh, I just, can I just interrupt you for a second to say I've had quite a bit of anxiety and then felt all sorts of ambivalence around like, like, thank you for the endorsement. It, it means a lot. Um, and so the ability to have a difficult conversation around something that was, and, and still is, you know, an upsetting, a very upsetting event um, to, to engage in that dialogue is something I, I really appreciate you doing. Um, and uh, I think like leaning into that discomfort is also what makes room for the fun. Um, and so like, I'm glad to feel like, you know, we, we've aired that out a little bit. Hopefully we continue to have a discussion. I think there's a lot there that we need to continue to work through, but um, to have had that discussion feels really good. And like, it's pretty cool actually, despite all the horrors of the world right now, to be able to sit and chat with you uh, and have a little happy hour drinks. So, so cheers and thank you for leaning into some of the fun with me as well. Yeah, but, but really, I mean, I, you know, I, I I'll personalize this and say, you know, I, mean, I, I really grew into adulthood in Athens. You know, I came here intent on attending graduate school. Um, you know, my first wife had a sister who lived here. And so this was an easy place to land, got here, found her for me, for a guy who already had a bachelor's degree, who was a white man, uh, a, a really great place to live, um, a fun place to live you know, relatively inexpensive place to live compared to, you know, Atlanta and Austin and Minneapolis and Norfolk, where I've been prior. Um, but, you know, it was probably within a year of working with kids here in the mid 90s that I was like, well, the, the things that I love about this town are, aren't universally loved about this town. And why is that? You know, wh why is it that not everybody in Athens thinks, damn, this is the greatest place ever? well, it's just people don't have the resources that, that I have, you know, whether those are the, you know, academic resources, the, you know, color of my skin, maleness. And, um, and, and what I would want is for everybody to enjoy the fruits of Athens, um, to, to enjoy being here, you know, to have a good place to live, uh, you know, get fun, you know, but the reason people don't have fun is because they're so subsumed in the challenges of their lives, um, you know, in, in having to, you know, work a job at the Gold Pantry and then another job at Kroger and then another job cleaning rooms at a hotel j just to tie ins together. You mm -hmm. know, that, that should be the case. So, you know, how do we create how do we create an environment where people don't have to work so much? So they're able to have more fun, provide more care for their kids, have a more fulfilling existence. And oh, by the way, you know, less likely to experience criminality yeah. and, yeah. Uh, and, and end up, you know, out, out on Lexington Highway. Um, you know, my, uh, I mean, as much as I hate that we spent as much money on the jail as we did and we built it for as the capacity that we did, I'm glad we've not maxed that out. You know, we've seen in my time in public service here um, go from about 550 people on average any night of the year in the jail to uh, pre-pandemic 400 people on average to now around 300. 
I mean, I like to think about that as the new ceiling for okay, our jail yeah, population. I was, I, I was hoping that you might bring that up. Yeah. So you, you said 300 in your conversation with Chris, you had said you thought it was around 225 or 250. It, it, has it, it gone it, up it, since then? Or, yeah, or it, it has. It, it, it had bottomed out kind of in probably the first 60 or 80 days of the pandemic, and it's crept up a little bit. So how do we, how do we meaningfully define a ceiling, and and what do you think we can do to get to keep people from going there? Well, um, you know, some of the things that we'll do are decade long journeys. Mm -hmm. So you know, talking about you know, people my kids' age who are eight now, we we need to be working on quality lives for them. But we also need to be working on quality lives for the people who are in the age span who might be uh, most likely to be arrested. So that's your, you know, 17 to 25 year olds. Mm -hmm. You know, superior now retired superior court judge told me a couple of years ago, he's like, if I can successfully get somebody to 25 or 26, it's likely I'll never see him again. Well, so we need to really double down on your late teens, early 20s population. Mm -hmm. And we also need to double down on supports for your population just a little bit younger than that. I mean, I can tell you from my five years of, of teaching seventh and eighth graders that, that that's a real time in life when you see this fork in the road where you know either you find some measure of success and then that becomes reinforced in life and self-reinforcing in a lot of ways, or you don't find some measures of success and unfortunately, that becomes self-reinforcing too, you know, in, in a way that's going to lead to people being in positions where they're more likely to be arrested or around people who get arrested. So are there some programs that we're putting in place that you think are helping with this? Yeah, I, I mean, and you know, there are many things that we've begun doing in small scale that just need to be large scale. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the last five years, the work that we've done in conjunction with the Young Urban Farmers and, and that program for high school age students and the Young Urban Builders, where you've got kids who are getting involved in like really cool, productive, fun activity and learning some skills. And also, even more than learning skills in terms of operating a saw or planting sweet potatoes, you know, developing, you know, what the, you know, theoreticians would call social capital, like meeting adults in your community that can steer you toward things. I mean, you know, uh, among those things that made Athens great for me is, oh, I knew some people here. And because I knew some people here, I was able to get into some cool positions. And I was able to get a job student teaching at Cedar Shoals High School. And I was able to get a job, you know, as a paid teacher at Coyle Middle School because I knew some people. And so introducing young people to, you know, community resources, mm -hmm. you know, not in some sort of a, a, a teacherly kind of way, but just in a sort of natural way is going to be helpful. Um, and uh, pushing that down to the slightly younger crew, say your 11 to 15 year olds is, is a big step in that direction too. So we, we put $400,000 of uh, middle school social and uh, and uh, kind of fun support activities into this year's budget. We haven't defined that yet, but we put that there recognizing how important that age span is. Um, th the other thing we can do is really make better and safer places for people to live. And I don't just mean safer in terms of, you know, is your back window likely to get broken into? I mean, certainly that's true, but also safer in terms of like, is your roof likely to leak? <laughs> um, you know, is your toilet likely to explode? Are you likely to fall through your floor? You know, th 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 those kind of ways too. Um, and, and so the the $45 million that we put into affordable housing in the SPLOS 2020 program, um, the additional affordable housing that we'll be able to yield out of the tax allocation districts, all of those are just going to mean more stable and, and counter to that less desperate lives that have to be lived in Athens. And so that all helps. I mean, you, 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 you hit the nail on the head. You know, many of the people who are in the jail are in there because of economic and behavioral health trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can, if you keep some of that trauma at bay, you know, you cool the temperature. 
and you benefit yeah. the whole community. You know, I, I, I think a lot about, you know, the, the, the 220 year history of Athens as, as a place with that name. Mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know, this has never been a community that embraced everybody that had in its stated goal set that everybody was really going to have those opportunities for health and livelihood. Um, you know, the, the first 150 years, it was explicitly the opposite. It was explicitly the notion yeah. that, you know, we're, we're going to enslave or quasi enslave, you know, a big chunk of those people for the, you know, for, for the welfare of some others. And then, you know, in the post-World War II years, you know, we sort of bled into this bifurcated, well, you know, either you're associated with the university and the intellectualism there, or, or you're in the service economy kind of notion. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the great, great grandchildren of people who would have been working in cotton fields, you know, were asking, you know, like, you know, do you want fries with that sandwich? Mm -hmm. um, and, and now, you know, the conversation is, you know, how do we ensure that everybody has a fair wage? How do we ensure that everybody has, uh, again, a safe in every regard place to live um, and can get to safe places? You know, I think the sometimes people don't think about how important things like bike and pedestrian infrastructure are. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, if you're a kid living up off Spring Valley Road in a trailer home, right now you can't safely go get a damn Snickers bar. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the things that simply make life livable when you're, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, you mm -hmm. know, when the Firefly Trail connects downtown Winterville and downtown Athens, that same 13 year old, you know, will have 100 places to get that Snickers bar, will simply have access, physically have access to things that aren't available today. So, you know, even those pieces of our, uh, of our infrastructure have these social dividends that will pay off. Um, could I just ask about a few, I, I, I imagine in my head, like rattling off some policies kind of quickly, sure, although sure. I imagine you'll have some We, we, we can do that. We, we can do rapid fire. Yeah. Um, but I, I might not be able to do like two words or less as a response. But. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so decriminalization of, um, drugs, drug possession, decriminalization, um, you know, small amounts of marijuana is usually where people go. Um, but I'd like to actually think more broadly about just like, um, having a parallel ordinance on the books for drug possession. Um, I know that's something we talked about kind of one-on-one -on -one in the park. Um, and I've talked to some public defender folks and stuff since. And, and part of what they said was still the value of having a parallel ordinance um, beyond the diversion center is it enables you to use it for folks who might not qualify for the diversion center program. And it also gives the public defenders another tool in their toolbox to try to plea things down. Um, so I'm just curious uh, if, like the, I'm guessing it would be the Legislative Review Committee that would mm -hmm. explore it. Is that something that you'd be in favor of giving them to explore? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still open to that. I mean, you know, one of the, I mean, just even around marijuana, you know, we're in the single digits of misdemeanor marijuana arrests alone this calendar year, you know, okay. versus this point last calendar year, we were over 50. So, so that's already begun to pay off. I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that works. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also interested really in the state and the feds, you know, working on some of these questions too. You know, I think reclassification is an important thing for the federal government to do. And, you know, I mean, we, we as a nation have been, you know, on this multi-decade really unproductive uh, drug war that, you know, I'd like to think in the next administration and in the next Congress is really going to see a sharp turn, um, you know, recognizing that we're talking about a healthcare question. Um, and yeah, and I love that healthcare framing. That was actually, that kind of piggybacks on a conversation I was having earlier with the candidates discussed thing about thinking more broadly about healthcare and, and the way that- Yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're, talking to somebody whose godfather died of a speedball overdose. You know, I mean, I'm, you know, I've been conscious since I was a kid of, you know, the reality that people's trauma is directly connected with people's drug use. Mm -hmm. um, so would you see value in us putting in some decriminalization measures 
now, even though, because I, I imagine anything that happens on the federal level is going to be a ways down the road, regardless. And if we're talking about trying to reduce the jail population, um, is that something that we could look into? I know, I know I'd be excited about it. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we need to look at the whole toolbox. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, I'm excited to continue to look at that toolbox. And I, I hope that we can look at putting that tool in it. <laughs> um, I'm also curious, you talked about like quality of housing for tenants. And you've probably heard me talk a lot about what mm -hmm. I like to call tenants, tenants rights. Work. Um, and so is that also something we could look at, you know, kind of broadly? It is. Like yeah. I mean, I think in a prior conversation, I, I, I'd shared that um, Georgia legal aid, you know, is, you know, a formal mechanism for tenant support. But you've got one employee for Georgia Legal Aid that's split between this market and the Gainesville, Georgia market. So, you know, you're talking about something like 300,000 people who've got one individual to call yeah. for that kind of thing. And that, you know, there are even some things that can easily be done right now. So in, um, in Clark County's uh, or Code of Ordinances, we've adopted large segments of the International Building Code that includes some responsibilities for landlords around maintenance of, of facilities. So that roof is not supposed to leak. You're not supposed to fall through the floor by code. Uh, it, it does take a tenant calling up code enforcement and inviting them inside to say, hey, look at the hole in my floor or the hole in my roof. Um, I, I, I don't know that we message that effectively. Um, and I'm not sure that we've got the sort of uh, liaisons in place to support that. So I think taking what we've got and using it more effectively could could also benefit us. I had a really good conversation with Spencer Fry about this a while ago, and he had mentioned the Georgia Legal Aid, you know, one person scenario and this mm -hmm. idea of like codes that we already have in the books that people may not know about. Um, so beyond uh, making the public aware, I'm also wondering if we can build in place more rights for people to say, back out of their lease if it's not fixed in a certain amount of time or um, mm -hmm. be able to fix it themselves and then deduct it from their rent, you know, things yeah. like that that give people a bit more. Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny you say that. I mean, I, I, I had had, you know, when I was in my early mid twenties, exactly those explicit agreements with a couple of landlords, you know, like, I, you know, I moved into this dump of a place outside Atlanta and, uh, you know, basically renovated the place and they agreed to it on the front end. And so, you know, anything I paid for, I just submitted receipts and took that off my rent, um, you know, but but making that kind of more standardized, you know, would, would be of great benefit to everyone. Um, and then what about the single family ordinance? I was actually really jazzed to hear Commissioner Wright um, bring up like, why can we can we tackle this? And I know that there are some other folks in the commission who have mixed feelings about it, but it seems like a lot of people want to at least look at it. Is that something mm -hmm. that you think we can look at? Yeah, too? I mean, I, as a matter of fact, I think we've got a legal responsibility to look at that. You know, if you look at what Housing and Urban Development would say about the legality of uh, local uh, definition of family ordinance is really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're in currently in a home, you can't have more than two unrelated persons in a single family uh, neighborhood and, and unless there's a non-conforming use. Like for example, I'm here on Pulaski Street and mm -hmm. the, the house right next door to me is a quad and it was a quad in 1980. And so it's allowed to still be a quad today. Um, I, I, mean, I think that's something we've got to look at. You know, we do have to be, and you referenced it just a moment ago, also conscious of, you know, how can we do this in a way that's still supportive of some of those neighborhoods that really before the modern era of student apartment construction were underway had sort of become overrun. I don't think I use that too strongly overrun with some, you know, college kid houses, you know, on blocks where there were otherwise people just trying to, you know, walk their dog and raise their kids. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the parties and such that ensue. Um, That's right. So uh, that seems to dovetail a bit with, this, you know, inclusionary zoning, kind of a, a broader mm -hmm. um, term, I guess, you know, that could include tackling definition of family, but also like accessory dwelling units or mm -hmm. tiny houses, 
things like that. Um, yeah. Are, so about a year and really 15 months ago, thereabouts, uh, I assigned to the planning commission and, and, and thus to the planning department, uh, a suite of responsibilities to produce some inclusionary uh, zoning drafts that, that include um, accessory dwelling units, you know, look at smaller home size, you know, basically tiny homes, um, you know, look at um, density bonuses for affordable units, um, to look at any other code sections that have made affordable housing unfeasible, you know, because there, there are always things, you know, we need to be self-examining, you know, as, as an organization. I mean, the same way that I had to ask myself after May 31st, like, you know, what, what was jacked up about that? What do I need to do better? And what does this government have to do better? You know, we have to ask in the broad frame of something like housing too, you know, how do we do better? Are we, uh, are, are we out of step with what community needs are? So it will be late this autumn when the planning commission makes sort of a broad set of recommendations to the county commission. My understanding is that they, they're gonna sort of create a sort of a buffet that, that the county commission can then draw from and enhance. Um, so it's not like they're gonna come with something fully baked, but they're gonna say, hey, accessory dwelling units would make some sense in these contexts. You know, we recommend you do some more work on that. Okay. Because really it's, a, I mean, it's critical. You know, we're in a community of 130,000 people, but also in which 40,000 people come into town from outside athens Clark every day to work. Now, not all 40,000 of those people would want to live in Athens. You know, you, you might have a pair of partners where one lives in, uh, you know, where one works in Atlanta, one works in Athens, and they split the difference and live in Snellville. You know, I mean, that's, that's a phenomenon that you're always going to have, but it shouldn't be infeasible for people to live in Athens if they're working in Athens. You know, Athens is where there are academic and healthcare resources, where there is public transit, you know, where there is good shopping close at hand. And so, you know, I think it's our responsibility to create new housing opportunity here. You know, and, and you know, and I say this as a one time economics teacher, you know, that means you also have to sort of think across the, the span of housing needs. And so you do have to think about the more subsidized end of the affordable housing or workforce housing continuum. But you even have to think about housing for somebody who might be making 75 grand or 150 grand a year, because what happens in terms of market forces is if your supply gets as low as it is right now, it unnecessarily inflates the price of everything on the market. Mm -hmm. You know, real estate agents will tell you that, you know, there are only something like 300 houses on the market right now in this, um, in this real estate district, which is Clark and Oconee County together, which is an all time low, which is curious given that our population collectively is at an all time high. Mm -hmm. So th that means that anything that comes on the market is priced relatively high because people can demand that in the kind of traditional economic supply and demand kind of way. Okay. Um, just to clarify, like finer point, is the definition of family part of what the planning commission is looking at or is that like a separate? Th that would be separate. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess uh, one other thing I'm, I'm curious if you're interested in looking at, I, I think, is there a, a work session coming up about it, you said, uh, looking at the use of inmate labor. And That's right. So, um, so, so in Georgia's correction system, which is the, the state system uh, for, uh, you know, uh, person sentenced, um, you, you really have right now kind of a multi-tier um, mechanism for placement. You've got people who are in a corrections department facility um, kind of in their initial years. You then have people who are relatively close to, um, to being able to be out of prison or paroled who may go into a county corrections unit and they may do some work for the county, either internal, like working in a kitchen um, or external cutting grass on the street you know, working as an electrician's assistant, that kind of thing. And then you have another phase, which is called transition center. 
And so that's somebody who's living in what's effectively a halfway house. Yeah. And, um, and so they're, you know, they're paying rent there as a tenant and they're required to live there for a period of time. It may be a year, 18 months, that's typical. Um, but, but they're working a, a job for pay out on the street. We have some people who are in that transition center status here in the Clark County Corrections Unit, um, which again is the county uh, housing some state inmates. And what my interest is, is in expanding the proportion of those people who are in those corrections center spots. Um, you know, some viewers may know Georgia is one of only a very small handful, single digit number of states that doesn't pay inmates when they're doing um, community work, you know, the, those lawnmowers and the like. Uh, one of the things that can be legally enhanced in that environment, though, are sort of non-cash benefits. So, you know, you can get people in education you know, you, you can have somebody get a degree, um, you know, or a technical certificate to be a welder or an engine mechanic, um, you know, or a coder. And, you know, when, when I've spoken to, to folks who are inmates, you know, their biggest concern is being able to live a viable life once they are no longer incarcerated. And I think you know this, Jesse, but I worked for with inmates for four years when I was at Foothills in, in three uh, state prisons. And, and, and it's for, for those folks, it's all about what am I going to do after this? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think a critical focus is saying, how can we, the athens Clark County government, utilize our tools and our resources to set as many people up as possible with high quality skills when they move past this. So we've done some things and I'm proud of, we, um, we got a welding unit just this year, uh, or actually I think maybe it was tail end of 2019. Um, and, and we're infusing more educational and formal training opportunities. But, you know, I, I think it has to be our explicit goal to say, you know, how do we ensure that, that we're basically supercharging every one of these individuals with the opportunity to be successful beyond this experience in their lives. And so that also includes expanding those transition center beds. So we're poising as many people as possible to say, okay, you know, there may be this 12 month period when because of, you know, the current State Department of Corrections regulations, you may not get paid for this lawn care, but the next 12 months or the next 18 months when you're in the transition center or halfway house environment, you know, you can be out there working for, you know, $13 an hour for Pilgrim's Pride. Um, and, and we can be supporting you to make sure that the step beyond that, you're going to be working for $20 an hour for Caterpillar. Okay. Um, and so if we expand those uh, transition center beds, um, would that be basically reducing the number of beds? We wouldn't be reducing the number of beds in the prison facility when we did that, right? We'd just be adding more people overall. Uh, you, you, you could do it either way, frankly. I mean, uh -huh. you know, I mean, part of it is just, you know, how much resource we devote to that. But um, right now, you know, I'm giving you rough numbers. So these are not exact. You know, we've got something like, 150 people in the corrections unit, um, you know, who are, you know, w w imprisoned. And then we've got something like 30 people who are in the transition center environment. What the, um, what the corrections chief has said is he thinks we can at least go up to 80 people who are doing transition center work. Okay. And so basically tilting the balance. So some of those beds that might currently be occupied by um, by corrections unit inmates would instead be occupied by transition center um, okay. folks. Okay. Um, and and it's, how, it's, how much of what we do has to be approved by the Department of Corrections on the state level? Because I know that there was mm -hmm. a proposal you all had in the budget, right, to, to try to get what was still an extremely small amount, but something, right, to pay inmates for their labor and then the department of corrections put in place a policy kind of preempting that i guess so so they've, they've always had a policy preempting that okay. so what we just to be clear what we put in the budget was 
$150,000 for inmate support. Okay. Anticipating really that, you know, that was going to be primarily educational support and training. So yeah, I spoke to the Department of Corrections six weeks ago, and, and they reiterated to me that, no, we will not let you pay inmates who are Department of Corrections inmates. So so that remains the case. So, you know, we, I mean, this is one of the things that you find yourself challenged by in local government all the time, which is to say, all right, we're in this statewide dynamic that we don't like. So we can say, well, we're not going to have any interaction at all with the state on this matter. Uh -huh. But that would be also then to say that, all right, well, all these corrections units folks then may end up in Pulaski County or Hart County or, or somewhere that may not give them the support and the training and the opportunity to transition into those transition beds, transition center beds that we're able to do. So you say, how can we do the best we can do given the statewide dynamic that we're in? Is it possible for us to only do the transition center part and not do the uh, what for what feels to me like just totally slave labor part? <laughs> I mean, certainly, I, I think that's that's something that you know you could do. Um, again, you know, and and I understand the slave labor comment. I mean, I, I would say that most of the inmates would not characterize it in the same way that mm -hmm. the some members of the activist community have, uh -huh. you know, if you talk to them directly, um, you know, I mean, there's a very different reality between what Douglas Blackman wrote about in Slavery by Another Name, you know, the uh, sort of leasing, convict leasing system, you know, and what goes on, you know, today in a corrections unit. But I would also say that if you were to do that, what you're doing is you're shifting all those people again to those other communities in Georgia. So you're not actually going to decrease the number of people in prison, but you might inadvertently put them in a prison that's a less supportive, less caring place than what we can create here. So, it, it, you know, there, there's a dilemma there. There's a conundrum. You know, mm -hmm. do, do you want to say, all right, well, we recognize that the contours that we have to live within because we are in Georgia are not ideal, but we're going to make the best version of it possible. You know, or do you say, well, we don't believe there's any good version of it possible. So, you know, we'll let, we'll let Macon, we'll let Augusta and we'll let Columbus have those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that's a, it's a tricky one. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it I, is. Um, this has been, at the fore of my mind, more than most things I've been talking about in the past year at the campaign and everything. Um, because to me, there's something that feels, you know, however, however blurry the line is between too unethical and complicated and stuff I don't like, but we do it anyway, right? There's, there's something about participating in a prison system that cages people except when they're laboring for free that seems so like fundamentally wrong to me that you know i wonder if there's a way to opt out of that and use that as a way of trying to leverage a broader conversation that does need to happen about criminal justice reform um while thinking about the whole problem less in terms of like the individuals and more in terms of like the system like ultimately like we're in charge of a system um, and if we're participating in a portion of that system that is fundamentally more humanizing like the transition center um, maybe like we can keep that going um, and and find ways to have more people involved there without participating as directly in the parts that to me feel fundamentally dehumanizing um, but I'm hearing from you difference in, in, in this perspective, right? You give a different perspective on this and you've also worked more directly with a lot of these folks. So I guess, you know, you, you kind of called out my referring to it as slave labor. It's not what they would call it. Right. So I, I'm curious, like, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's, it's clearly to me something that you're wrestling with. Right yeah, now. yeah, of course. I, I, absolutely. No, I mean, I think, I, I think you work more than one angle at a time. I mean, I, I would say, and you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm open to other conversation, but I would say you create the best possible environment you can 
given that the statewide, even given that the statewide dynamic is not what we would prefer. And at the same time, we work on the statewide dynamic. Mm -hmm. So we elect more Democrats to the state house. If we take over the state house, we have some options. We work on the governor's race in two years. Yeah. You know, we, we, we get a different governor, we have real different options. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, and I understand, I mean, I, I understand the starkness with which people view labor by prisoners, particularly that's unpaid. Uh, but I also want to, but I also know how important it is to do a good job taking care of individual human lives. And, and I do believe that we can do a better version of it in Athens than maybe done in some other places. Um, one last thought on this, just cause it's a, uh, an area where I lack knowledge um, in terms of who runs. So Clark County government pays the warden but That's is the correct. state government paying the, the others who work in the prison? No, um, so the, um, the the Clark County Corrections uh, Department is is a department of Clark County. Okay. We, we, we operate it in a contract with the State Department of Corrections. So they have to approve some of the contours there. There are some, you know, basically there are some contractual elements of you know, what has to happen there. Um, and then they do pay a, um, a daily per inmate fee that's about $20 per individual per day. And so do we have, I, I know you say you have to kind of like get them to agree, and maybe this is more deep in the weeds than mm -hmm. you know about or care to talk about right now, but uh, I guess one, five, I'm thinking a lot of like solitary confinement as one of many uh, practices that are widely used in Georgia and around the country, but that seemed really awful to me. Um, a, I guess, are we, to use that as an example, although it's not the only thing, do we use solitary confinement? Um, and then I guess, if so, um, is that something that we can do away with? Is that within our purview or do we need to get approval for that? that that's a good question. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know that level of detail on okay. like, you know, whether tactically we can just declare, you know, that's a thing we don't do. Because um, a lot of times I wonder how much people who are in a situation as awful as our prison system get asked by someone, you know, well, how do you feel about this program? And in Clark County, they're treated better than they have been anywhere else, you know, so of course they're gonna be like, this is great. All, all they want to do is stay here and not have to go somewhere else. Um, but that's kind of plotted on the spectrum of a bunch of really bad options, right? And so sure, there, there are always the to, options that you yeah. could envision that aren't yeah. existent, Yeah. you know, um, except maybe in other countries. Sure, yeah. And I, I actually love to look at how other countries do it because I feel like there are some more humane models out there. Um, Part of that, of course, as we've already talked about, is just putting fewer people there. But then, so there's kind of that front end, how do we approach public safety policing the, the courts here in Clark County to try to put fewer people in that system? Um, but as far as like people we're interacting with who are already in it, um, trying to think about how to make it as, as humane as possible and really make it as like compassionate as possible. Mm -hmm. you know, it's already bad enough to be deprived of your freedom and there's all these ways that we sort of exacerbate it that are very normalized and I'd be curious to learn to the degree that we can like what else we can do to to make it better yeah well and I know you're doing sort of the round robin of departmental visits as a commissioner-elect yeah. you know I'd, I'd encourage you to spend some time over in the corrections unit and, I've, and I've, I've requested it but we haven't gotten there yet so, okay yeah, yeah you'll, you'll get there and, and and talk to some of the folks who are there you know, have uh, conversations. I mean, that they'll they'll speak openly about <laughs> anything you want them to. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I guess. I mean, we could go all day. I don't know how how long you want to go here. Um, I, do uh, I don't know. The, the, are, are there a couple more things you want to talk about? Uh, we have a question from the chat that I yeah. I guess I don't know what it is. I'm getting it post it noted to me, um, <laughs> and then. Uh, Do any prison? Oh, this. Mm -hmm. um, so somebody in the chat asks, "Do any prisoners have a debt to society as a way of restorative justice?" Is that the question that you want me to? That's the question. Okay. 
do any prisoners have a debt to society as a way of restorative and, and seeing justice? who asked that i can imagine kind of their angle on that um do you want to take that one first or would you like me to um I mean, I, you know, are you asking me to be sort of a moral arbiter or are you asking from a, you know, how does the legal system work kind of a way? Um, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that question, but it sounds to me like what they're getting at is that uh, when we talk about paying prisoners, that it, that the, that the prisoners have a debt to society that they're paying, I guess. Um, Sure. So, I mean, uh, and then they've, they've married that with a, the term restorative justice, which is not usually where I hear that term applied. But um, yeah, yeah. No, well, I mean, I, I can give you a couple of just nuts and bolts about you know how elements of the Georgia correction system work. So, um, Georgia um, correction system inmates do work on this um, on what you can kind of think of as a restorative point system. That they call pick points, PIC points, mm -hmm. where they look at um, kind of life skills, educational attainment, and, and and one other area that's skipping my mind. And and so they're sort of building toward the the, the set of competencies, um, you know. And 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 some of that, in in my experience, is through therapeutic activity. Um, probably not enough. I mean, it's interesting. So the the challenges in the correction system are in some ways mirrors of challenges in society at large. So, um, so there isn't enough behavioral health support in Georgia broadly. There's also not enough behavioral health support in the prisons, mm -hmm. despite, as you've noted, Jesse, this enormous need. So, you know, one of the prisons I worked at was Phillips State Prison, which is in Gwinnett County and off Hamilton Mill Road. And it's one of the Georgia corrections, uh, prisons that specializes in behavioral health needs. So something like 60% of the 600 people there, you know, have specified behavioral health needs. I mean, and, and they're there to get therapeutic support. But I think anybody in there, employee, inmate, or otherwise would say, like, we don't even have enough here. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's, it, I mean, you know, I, I think what happens in in life is that you know we don't have enough opportunities to learn um, good communication tools, and, and that includes around restoration. I mean, I you know I, I think most people in American life sometimes don't know how to apologize to a partner or spouse when they said something ugly. <laughs> like mm -hmm. you know, I mean, on, on on that small human personal yeah. scale, people don't learn how to interact in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so then when the challenges become larger or more egregious, people really don't know mm -hmm. where to go with that. You know, and I, you know, have had the good fortune to work with um, Georgia Conflict Center and in, in work with high school students and other organizations like that who specialize in restorative justice. And, you know, we we all wake up every day and have to reflect on like, what did I do well yesterday? And what do I need to improve upon? And, and that just doesn't naturally happen. You know, it doesn't, you know, it, it's not like rain falling on your head and suddenly wisdom <laughs> ending up yeah. inside, yeah. you know, it, it only happens through intentionality and practice mm -hmm. and support. And, um, and, and who needs that support most, you know, people who've been in challenging situations including those who've been engaged in the criminal justice system. And so, you know, if, if a married couple going through a little bit of a difficult time needs some support, I mean, sure as shit, somebody who's been in prison for five years needs some support. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I, what I like about so much of how you were kind of responding to that question there is, is this idea of support, you know, that like really these are people, these are human beings, you know, and and putting in place support structures that involve supporting them yeah. so that, you know, really they and we all benefit from, from that support. So. Yeah, I mean, in, in the four years that I spent inside prisons in Georgia, I mean, what was most recurrently notable to me is that there was no difference between those 20 year olds who I worked with that were uh, incarcerated in uniforms mm -hmm. and the 19 or 20 year olds I'd worked with the, the year before who were here in the Clark County School District. I mean, like none, no difference. Yeah. Um, just, just people, 
you know, may have done some stupid stuff and were in the wrong place and got caught. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, hell, I mean, it, you know, if, if, if I had been a different color and been in sli just very slightly different circumstances, that would have been me inside and it uh -huh. would have been somebody else coming to visit me. Yeah. Hopefully, right? Hopefully there's somebody. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think a lot, again, that this kind of cycles back to the way we approach policing. Um, something this book that I'm really excited about. Let's keep plugging it. I want everybody to read it. Uh, I'm waiting for an echo. Um, Man, are, are you getting residuals there, Jesse? I, 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 I need not. to know. I just, I, what I like is that it came out this year. And so there's all kinds of uh -huh. prison Real stuff. stuff. I've been very excited to read, yeah. but something that has very up-to-date statistics, I think is like really, and then and then a, an argument. Uh -huh. really with it. Um, maybe if I plug it enough, I'll get some kind of uh, opportunity to talk to the author or something. <laughs> this, um, this chat brought to you by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this kitchen table chat brought to you by um, Penguin Press. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, weird, weird plugs there. Um, so, you know, she talks about how an, an, a, a person's, the next decade of a person's life can be decided by how an officer approaches an interaction. Mm -hmm. And if that officer decides to take them to the jail versus take them to a mental health facility. Um, and, and that's really where uh, I'm really excited to see us look, like if there's like something that feels really important to me to look at sooner than later, it's like, well, how can we try to equip the folks we have on the ground, police officers or otherwise, who are engaging with, with, with people in the community who are experiencing a mental health crisis, who are experiencing substance abuse, or who are maybe in some other situation that doesn't seem readily available like that, but is so often related to poverty or trauma or whatever other things. Like, how can we engage with folks in those situations and uh, like push them through an avenue that's not the traditional carceral system that we mm -hmm. have? Um, right. I mean, particularly knowing that, you know, I mean, what what criminalization begets is more criminality. Right. And so, you know, you, even, uh -huh. even on the misdemeanor level, um, you know, somebody who's jailed both on the six week and the 18 month horizon is more likely to end up in jail again than somebody who's taken into sort of a case management Kind of or kept there longer because while they're there, they, you know, freak out for some reason, probably related to the mental health situation. And then that, you know, they're in a, uh, an environment that's just about kind of punitive measures, negative reinforcement, you know, that won't work for some people. You know? So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so clearly, as Carol likes to put it, I, like she, we are eager beavers. Uh, and so with all these things that I'm excited to dig into, and you know, you've you've seen plenty of people in this excitement to the table in their first year, in your many years <laughs> on the body. Uh, um, I guess I'm curious, like you know, to not, uh, for lack of a better word, piss you off by <laughs> continually hounding you for the same uh, things to be put on an agenda or something. Like, what is the best way, uh, in your view, to try to advocate for some of these policies that I'd like to see us discuss as a full body? So you um, you came to the uh, uh, to, to the retreat a couple of weeks ago, uh -huh. and we're going to do a follow up in November. As a matter of fact, I need to get an email out today or tomorrow um, to to make sure I've, I've got the right combination of days for commissioners. So the best thing to do is really to tee things up, sort of on on, on an annual cycle. So in a local government, there's always like a boatload of stuff going on at once, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and we've got 1700 employees, but all of them are like working every day. And, and, and this year, I mean, it's been incredible to watch how much work is underway. Um, so if you can tee things up and you can say, all right, you know, as we set goals late in the calendar year, we can lay out what we're going to be spending energy working on in the next year. That benefits everybody because everybody's got a heads up. They can do the appropriate research you know, th they can schedule the sort of new activities in conjunction with just the things that have to happen every day as you, you know, fix the potholes, turn the lights on and, you know, collect the trash. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that really is the best way. Now, sometimes there are things that are emergent um, or, or, or things that, you know, take on extra gravity because of, you know, the the, the realities of, of year in, year out. So that's, that's never going to 
um, not be true, but to the degree that things can get lined up through intentional goal setting sort of ahead of a year, that's the best route. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I usually like to end these on a human note and give the person I'm talking with the last word. Um, so I'll preface my final question for you with uh, sort of my own scenario here, which is that today, somebody who you know has their own mental health struggles here, uh, I've had a, a very anxious day and I've been thinking a lot about the upcoming election and, and the, you know, the, we're just inundated with articles speculating on what version of instability right, we're likely right. to see uh, in the very near future. Um, and so I, I, I guess I'd like to invite you to share your thoughts, you know, whether in, as, a, as, a, as an individual human being on this planet and or as the mayor of a town or both um, on how to get through the coming weeks and months where it seems like a certain amount of angst instability <laughs> is, you know and and yeah like it, it's just it's it's hard to be optimistic mm. that we're going to get through this without it getting harder before it gets better so yeah i mean uh, i mean part of it i think is being honest with yourself i feel like i'm sounding like i'm a clinician um <laughs> Uh, but, but it's true, and, and he has. So I'm going to be parroting some of the things that clinicians have told me. So, so one is, you know, you, you be honest with yourself. I mean, you know, if there's some difficult road ahead, I mean, don't pretend like say la vie, la di da. Just be honest. Yeah, I mean, you know, next four weeks is probably going to be a little bit crazy. Mm -hmm. But then you also say, okay, well, what gets us through crazy times? Well feeling like you're doing something that's contributing and productive. And so if there's a contributing and productive thing that you can do, say around the upcoming election, for me, sometimes that's even planting yard signs. Like that's a, you know, I, sometimes I like to do simple, tangible things um, that, that, you know, may not have like enormous meeting, but, but I can point to and say, look, I did that thing. I planted that yard sign. So that's meaningful. You know, I think also treating yourself well and saying like, what do I need to do in the context of any day to, um, to just feel good and feel comfortable? I'm trying to walk a little bit every day. It's like my favorite exercise. And so even if I only walk for like 15 or 20 minutes, um, it, it makes me feel better. Um, I'm trying not to drink too much because that gives me anxiety. <laughs> and so, so, you know, so I'm not not drinking. I'm just not drinking very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and, and also kind of having conversations with people that are fun to talk to. So this is important to me because, um, you know, I have some social energy and if I don't expend that social energy in a productive way, you know, it sometimes gets mired in my own brain. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Um, that's not good for anybody. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and then I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to some like semi-frivolous cultural stuff. You like, the, the, there, there's some music coming out that I'm looking forward to. Um, uh, uh, I was a big fan of that Minneapolis Band of Replacements. And there's a, uh, there's a set of unreleased stuff of theirs that's coming out in a couple of weeks. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, there's a yeah. new Bruce Springsteen record coming out. So anyhow, you know, there's, you know, it's it, 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 it's it's the stuff that buoys you through, you know, all of the times, but especially the kind of crazy times. Um, and, and, you know, humor. I mean, you know, like, Lord Almighty, man. Uh, like, I've already scheduled to not work the day after the election. And, and of course, you know, I, and, and everybody should know, it probably really is going to be a kind of a multi-day saga of seeing returns come in. And, and just be okay with that. You know, just know that's that's the dynamic. You know, in the same way that when I was a teacher, it took me a few days to grade tests. It's going to take a few days to count these votes because they're coming yeah. in in a variety of ways, and that's okay. So just go mm -hmm. in knowing that. Um, but man, I uh, I felt like I should have taken the rest of the week off after that crazy debate the other night. Well, it wasn't even really a yeah. debate; it was just shit show. So, yeah. anyhow, Whew. yeah, all, well, all I'm the glad stuff. You're taking some time off uh, while not taking like the entirety of your time off to golf. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, Mayor Kelly Gertz, thank you so much for joining me for some kitchen table chats and sharing some, uh, or some, you know, porch chats or whatever, sharing some of your, your social energy with me. It's been, uh, it's been really enjoyable and I look forward to seeing you digitally or in person again real soon. All right. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Jesse. Cheers. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Have a good night. See ya.